survivors out there of the apocalypse? Is anyone out there? Can anyone hear me? No. Okay. They're all they're all gone. All right. Well, if you if this is the future, and this is after the coronavirus has killed off all the young people and all the old people, <laughs> Generation X will survive. Uh. <laughs> We're not doomsday people here. This is the Board Game Mechanics, and I am Katie, and with me, as always, even in COVID-19, is... <laughs> hey guys, what's going on? It is Jason. So, there's a lot of scary stuff on the media, and then a lot of morons posting more stuff on social media, so hopefully we can be kind of a, an uplifting, positive podcast for you guys to listen to. While you're um, quarantining yourself, practicing social distance, washing your hands, all of that fun stuff. Trying to find toilet paper. <laughs> yes, scavenging for ground <laughs> beef and toilet paper and whatever else. <laughs> all right. I don't know. I feel like I don't have any banter because um, we live in Ohio. And so, like, our governor is super, like, leading the way as far as, like, shutting things down and taking precautions and making a stay at home. So I haven't left the house. Um, I mean, on Sunday I went to my grandparents' house, which is like maybe three miles away or so. Didn't we go get some ice cream too? Did I get out of the car? Was that on Sunday too though? Oh yeah, that's true. That was Sunday. So, was, so all the same day. So yeah. it was all the same day. Um, prior to that, I hadn't left since like Thursday. So no, you, you went, you left all day on Monday. You oh, were gone all day Monday. Yeah, I was gone on Monday, which is crazy. Um, but since Monday, I have not left the house. Uh, I have not showered. <laughs> I have not <laughs> seen anyone but my husband and kids. Um, so I'm really trying to dig into this uh, social distancing, you know, sheltering where I'm at kind of business. Jason's yeah, if you've seen, uh, if you've seen Beyond the Thunderdome, you know, when he goes to that, like, where he finds all those like virile kids or whatever they are, what? feral kids, the feral, feral kids, not virile. That's gross. What's wrong with you? This is taking yeah. a turn. So, uh, so Katie looks like one of the feral kids. I do not. How dare you? Also, our wedding anniversary was this week. We did not get to go That's out for true. dinner or anything. We did no, not we do anything special. Um, we went out on a Friday, so that was fun. We managed to get out before um, all the restaurants shut down. So at least we did get to celebrate our anniversary. 13 years, me and Jason, of having live-in board game partners. <laughs> yep, that's true. Yeah, so um, it's it's good. Jason got me a uh, consulting detective, the Carlton House, um, like, set, which I'm so excited to play. Like, you don't even know there's like three extra maps and an envelope containing clues oh i can't wait to dig that sucker open and since i'm here in quarantine that's i mean self-imposed quarantine i want to play it by myself but i know my best friend who i play the games with would be so ticked if i did it without her so i won't yeah she'll be fine <laughs> i can't like act surprised if we try to play it later and i've already done it <laughs> yeah that's true yeah all right. I say we just move on to news because there's still stuff going on Kickstarter. So first, um, I want to talk about a game Kickstarter that's actually kind of a follow-up, a sequel to Trekking the National Parks, and that is Trekking the World. And so it looks like it's a route management game. Almost has it some Takedo-like elements in that you're trying to get like the most postcards or the most souvenirs. So it's like a couple different goals that you can meet while you're going around the world to visiting these great sites there's a lot of really pretty artwork involved in that i think like 40 cards with all these done by different artists with all these different locations around the world um you have like they're called destination cards where you have to fulfill like your goal kind of cards you've got like this little luggage that you're putting stuff in it looks cool um there's 17 days left on the kickstarter and it's um 40 bucks to get the game it it looks it looks fun because I love the idea of traveling and touring. And so this seems like it would be a fun little game. I've never played Trek in the National Park, so I'm not sure. Um, mostly because it's so expensive that I <laughs> is the reason why I haven't played it. Yeah, I know they sent Joel a copy and he did a review. So there's one on our channel you can go check out. But all I know about this one is the artwork is like a billion times better than the other one. At least in my opinion. Yeah, I think the um, 
the box art even is way is way better. Like substantially. Oh yeah, for sure. The other one's like a bear or something. Yeah. Yeah, which is okay, but this one does look really nice. So that's trekking the world. The second one I want to talk about. I'm so excited about. Like I really would love to back this. Um, I don't know if Jason will let me because the price point, but the theme is so cool. That means no. If you have to say because of the price point, that means no. Dang it, guys. It's called (laughs) Moonshine Empire. Um, And yes, it's exactly what it sounds like. Um, Old Pappy is getting ready to retire from his Moonshine Empire, and he's looking for somebody to take over. So it's in the bayou. You've got these characters that have like their own kind of abilities and powers. And, um, you know, they are trying to create moonshine so you've got like this kind of engine building where you're like upgrade you can upgrade your stills and all that stuff you can um go to an auction and like bribe pappy to give you like the best stuff first or like a discount on his good stuff to upgrade that then you're going to make the shine then you're going to choose different ways to get it to pappy and there's like little these cool little meeples like air like motorboats and like go-karts and stuff and trucks and like you gotta avoid like the police and gators and um it looks so cool i really really want it there's 26 days left on kickstarter i love unique themes this seems like a super fun theme that you could really get into start talking in accents and um I just think it would be really fun. So um, to get a copy of the game, which it has like um, uh, the base version has a lot of these super cool um, components and stuff for 49 bucks. Yeah. I was looking it up as you were talking uh, engine building uh, resource management. But then I saw a phrase that really turned me off loaded with interaction. I, I don't think it is, but maybe it is, but yeah, there is some player interaction, but it also has pick up and deliver. Hello. That's true. I mean, it looks awesome. Like, the art is really good. Yeah. Come on. We should get it. I'll look into it. (laughs) That means no. Guys, that means no. (laughs) That does mean no, probably. (laughs) Oh, see the life I live, people. See how how oppressed I am here. I can't even get a good game about making moonshine. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Yep. So our final game that I want to talk about, thank you, Mike, for um, telling me about this game. And it is called Rabbit Rummage. And Rabbit Rummage, it looks like it looks super light. Um, but the idea is that it's a really cute family weight game that can be um, just put in your pocket or your purse. It comes in like this kind of like canvas bag. And um, the cloth, there's like a cloth um board that folds out and so you've got these adorable little bunny meeples that you're moving around the board um this like garden area like collecting food and there's like a you're collecting certain types of sets of food and there's even this nice little um gardener element so he's like kind of working against everybody has a new little variant which looks cool um it's like 13 bucks for just like the game basic game itself um but what i really wanted which is actually no longer available which makes me cry the guy who produced this, he was handcrafting all the food. So like little pears and bananas and carrots and apples out of like polymer clay. They looked amazing and so adorable. And I wanted them so bad. And that was like a 30. It was only $37 for the deluxified edition. But he has sold out of those because he he's obviously I mean, he's hand making them. So I don't think, you know, he can't make quite as many. But I'm really sad that. I did not get one of those, but um, the game itself looks really cute. Again, like I said, little pocket version, really simple. Um, it's 13 bucks, and there are 17 days left on that Kickstarter, so that is a rabbit rummage. Yeah, those handmade pieces did look really nice. I was looking at the Kickstarter after you told me about it. Legit, right? Yeah, it does look really nice. I mean, this game is like featherweight. I think it would float away mm-hmm. if you were playing it, but... <laughs> It does. It does look really cute, though. I'll, I'll give it that. Well, it seemed like something like we could take to like a restaurant and like lay down on the table and play it with our girls because yeah. it's so light and just really cute too, and like really packaged um, to be portable. Right. Yeah, that's probably true. All right, and that's it for the news. I mean, I saw lots of cool stuff on Kickstarter. I could go on the news forever. Like I saw these dice that look like they're made out of water and there's little goldfish trapped inside. Like that's so cute. There's tons of cool stuff out on Kickstarter and I definitely don't have the market on that. So if there's something you're interested in, you want me to cover, want me to look at, um, just send me a message, post on the rivet or something. And I will get to the bottom of it. Well, and we don't talk about all of it because we don't want the podcast to be five hours. But Right. It's already long enough as it is because I can't be <laughs> succinct at all. We were just talking about that before it started. So, 
<laughs> yeah. All right, cool. All right, so this week in the gaming glossary, we have two more terms for you. Probably know some of these terms, but we're going to put our take on these terms and tell you what we think they mean. <laughs> so the one the one I'm going to talk about is abstract strategy, or just abstract if you want to call it that. So what an abstract game is, it's a themeless game. So that means they're not even trying to put it in farming. They're not trying to do it in like... The Mediterranean with nobles. The Mediterranean. There's no trading. It's just black and white pieces on a board doing some stuff. And then uh, usually it's perfect information. So you can see all your opponent's pieces. They can see all your pieces. There's very little or like zero luck usually. And the game focuses mostly on mechanisms and not on like story or anything. So uh, a, a classic abstract game would be chess, uh, checkers. Othello is the only what? abstract. Othello or Go. Oh, yeah. Othello, yes, Othello. Games like that, Pente. But some new modern games that you could check out would be like Santorini, which they put a theme on, but it's still themeless. That's right. Uh, Azul is an abstract game. It has a theme of something <laughs> themeless. Um, then there's all these like black and white games in like the Gip series. I haven't played any of them, but they have weird names like Gipped and Punked and weird stuff like that, Devon. So if, if you like games that have that type of thing going on. BGG has thousands and thousands of abstract strategy ga- strategy games on there. Go check them out, and I'm sure you'll find one that's up your alley. Unless you're like me and you hate abstract games, in which case you will not find one that's up your alley. That's true. I, I said if you like them. Right, like that, that's the caveat Bonitama there. Tama and, you know, I, they seem, I, like I keep thinking, yeah, I should try that. And then I play it, I'm like, Why? I don't care. Like, I just don't. Oni Tommy's actually not bad. I played that one once. But it is that track. What's that one that we played with Matt and Jamie that was like the four different... Element. 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 Woof. <laughs> I wanted to die. It was awful. The only abstract game I sort of liked was Grinto. Yeah, Grinto's good. Grinto is good. So a different type of game that is probably, I don't want to say the complete opposite, but pretty opposite of abstract. Pretty opposite, yeah. <laughs> is the Dungeon Crawl. And... Dungeon crawlers are um, games that are usually like fantasy based. I mean, I don't know if I could think of any that aren't fantasy based, but uh, there could. Uh, yeah, it's fantasy or dystopia, probably. Yeah. Um, but they're like they're kind of role playing games in that you take a character, you have a hero of some type, and you're going through like a either like an actual dungeon or some kind of like maze like kind of environment. Um, where you battle monsters, um, you gain loot. Sometimes you can like level up the character that you're playing with and like um, add to their experience or whatever or new abilities. They tend to come with their own abilities to start with, um, based on who you are. Um, so these games like these are like Mice and Mystics. Uh, Gloomhaven is probably the most popular dungeon crawl out there right now. Um, Temple of Elemental Evil, which I have played. It's based on Dungeons and Dragons. And Descent, also a very popular game um, that is a dungeon crawl. So you just get together a group. They are cooperative, I believe. All I don't know if all of them are, but... It's, sometimes it's like everybody versus one, too. Okay. Ooh, I don't like that, but... that That's how Descent works. Okay. So it tends to be where you're working with a group and you're fighting baddies um, right. to get stuff. And or make it out alive, which is what was happening with Temple of Elemental Evil. We're just trying to get out alive. Oh yeah, I love these games. <laughs> Jason hates these games. Um, yes, because like, hate is probably not even strong enough of a word. I, I think it's just they're all just the whole battling thing, which he doesn't like, and they do tend to come with minis, which he also doesn't like. Um, I don't mind them since I do play um, RPGs for fun. Um, so the idea of doing it on a board. Is like no big deal to me, and I'm fine with that. I kind of like it, um, but I don't get to play these often because of whom I have aligned myself with for the rest of my life. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you can play them. A lot of them you can play solo. Are you going to buy them? No. Okay, exactly. <laughs> Since you are basically the curator of our games, I cannot have the cute games that I want, like Moonshine Empire, because they're too expensive, nor can I have the dungeon crawls, even though I can play them by myself. So we got some real first world problems going on right now. I know, now. right? I'm being <laughs> oppressed. I am being oppressed. 
<laughs> oh man! So that is dungeon crawls, and that was the gaming glossary. I think we killed it. We killed it for another week. <laughs> So Jason's favorite segment is games played. And we actually, partially due to uh, coronavirus, have been playing a pretty decent amount of games. We've played a lot of games because we've had a lot of time at home. That's true. We have played a lot of games. And we will continue to play more. Jason's on this like great schedule at work where he's working like Monday, when- Monday, Wednesday, Friday, one week, and then Tuesday, Thursday, the next week. So I have a feeling there'll be more days of gaming in our future. Oh, yeah. There definitely will be. And my band has had some concerts canceled, so that opened up some extra days as well, which is pretty nice. Yeah. All right, so the first game I want to talk about is a game that's on Kickstarter now, which could have been in the news spot, but since we were going to talk about it here, Katie refrained. Yeah, I saved it. Yeah. So this game is called Paris, and this is from Kramer and Kiesling and Game Brewer. Game Brewer recently put out Goo Gong, which is pretty good. Yeah. And Kramer and Kiesling put out tons of good stuff. Um, trying to think what a big one is. From Do them. we like uh, them? I can't. I thought there was a bunch of their games we didn't like. I I just think they're too light. They're, oh, they're okay. usually too light for me. But like, yeah, a lot of people like them. I think we have a couple other ones, but I'm drawing a blank right now. But th- in this game, you're basically trying to travel around. I I can't say the the words because I'm not good at language. But there's like an arc of triumphant or something. Arc de triomphe. Yeah, Napoleon went through it. It's real tall because he's real short. I know that because you told me about that. <laughs> You're welcome. But but there's like this these sections of the city. Basically, the game board's a big rondelle. There are six sections of this city. And what you're trying to do is you're basically doing this worker placement area control thing where you're taking these little keys and you're going to go to a port on one of the six sections or in the middle and possibly get some money. Then what you're going to do is on another turn, you may move that key from the port onto one of the six buildings in the area to either collect resources or collect prestige. What you're trying to do with resources and prestige is build these landmarks or build onto the eight building to get more influence in that area and more points. Because at the end of the the game, if there's an area that has four keys, someone's going to put an in-game bonus tile in there, and whoever has the most influence across all the buildings is going to get the top points. And then all the while you're doing that area control thing, then there's this little Takedo piece on the outside of the board where you're moving this little guy around and you're collecting one-time bonuses that are going to give you in-game points. They might let you break some rules. They might give you some extra money, some extra resources, all that good kind of stuff. But the trick with that is, like Takedo, you can move as far forward as you want, but you can't go backwards. And once you hit the end of the track, you can't move anymore. So you're trying to balance out how much you're going to move around that track. It's a pretty good game. Like for a Kramer and Kiesling game, it's pretty heavy. They usually don't make games this beefy and thinky, and I really like this one. Uh, there's a video that I did on YouTube. You can go check that out. And if you're interested, there's a link to the Kickstarter in the video description. You can go pick that up. So that's Paris. Yeah, it was pretty fun. Um, like the f- the fact that it's not like it's not you you do you you draw a tile and then you play a key. Like the actual action is not difficult. It's just the process of where I'm going to put it. What's going to get me the most points? Do I need to move something? Do I need resources? Like there is a lot to think in this. I also think you know, we had just the prototype. I think it's really pretty. I know the, we post a picture on the Riveted. And yeah, the board does look busy at first. And then once you get down to it, you realize, okay, it's just repeated things. And actually, it looks less busy when you put down the tiles for the city. So I really enjoyed it. We actually, I think we, the only Kramer and Kiesling game we have is... A- uh, yeah, that sounds right. I was looking around while you well, were talking. Well, the thing is, you, you talked about all the, the games earlier, like um, Tikal and Mexica and... Yeah, we don't have any of those, yeah. No, we don't. We have some from Kiesling, like Heaven and Ale. Yeah, we don't have Port but we yeah, don't have Puerto Negra. We don't yeah, have we don't that. have yeah, we don't have many any of those. Nope, we don't. Sorry, guys. I'm not sure why we don't. We just don't. But this I, was good. I just think they're too light. Yeah. But this this was a good one. Um, another new game that we actually bought, which is rare for us, but we were out for our anniversary. So Jason likes to feel generous uh, sometimes when it's our anniversary, and. Um, <laughs> So I saw at Barnes & Noble, actually, Sushi Roll, which I've wanted for a while because I really love Sushi Go Party. Um, play that a lot. The Gosh, I think the artwork is some of my, some of my favorite because it's just so 
stinking adorable. And the game is fun. Like, it's one of my favorite kind of drafting games. So Sushi Roll is the dice version of that. Um, And it kind of puts a spin on the game because you get to see what's in everyone else's hand. It's actually on the sushi conveyor belt. And so when you draft, you can see what's out there, what's coming up, but you've also got the opportunity to use chopsticks to swap out a die from your um, conveyor belt to somebody else's. You can use a menu to re-roll dice in hopes of getting something else. Um, I really enjoyed it. It's it's still the same. If you know how to play sushi, go. Converting to this is very easy. Um, sometimes card drafting especially for first timers can be a little overwhelming. And so I think this is, this would be like a nice entryway to that. Um, but it's still not difficult, but I loved it. The dice are cute. Same cute little animations. It was great. Yeah. I think I like this one a little better than sushi go. Really? Yeah. I like the, um, perfect information piece so I can look around and see what's coming my way. And I like to being able to, as much as I hate, like take that stuff. I like taking the chopsticks and taking what I need from somebody. Mm. Yeah. I, I like it a little better. Yeah. I liked it. It was good. But either way, I mean, Sushi Roll or Sushi Go, they're like 80% the same. So <laughs> if you know how to play one, you can play the other. All right. So the last game I'm going to talk about is a game that we all played. Me, you, and my buddy Brandon, his wife, and his daughter, we played it. And it's called Detective Club. And this is from Blue Orange. And what this game is, is... It's like a a twist on Dixit. So it uses the same kind of funky art that Dixit uses. It has these big like tarot-sized cards. And what you're doing in this is someone's going to be the um, investigator or something. Yeah, I think I it's can't called remember investigator. The terms. So someone's going to be the investigator. They're going to play down a card. Then they're going to write a word that goes along with their card in everybody's notebook except for one. They're going to shuffle the notebooks, and they're going to pass them out to every, every other player. In secret. So every other player. In secret, yeah. So... All players around the table, except for one, is going to know the word that the interrogator or investigator is trying to explain. So then every other player is going to play a card. It'll go back to the investigator. He plays or he or she plays another card. Then it comes back around. Then once everybody's played two cards, the investigator will flip the word and show everybody what the word is. And then everyone's going to go around and try to explain why they pick the cards that go with that word. So... What every, all the other players are trying to do is trying to figure out who's the person that didn't know the words or the word based on the cards that were played. So, like, maybe you're trying to listen to the story that these people were pitching and seeing how far, how crazy it is. Although sometimes people just play bad cards because you have bad cards. Right, because they're all, <laughs> but, like, really strange, abstract-looking yeah, things. Yeah, so you're just trying to figure out who's the worst liar or who told the worst story or whatever. And then if only zero or one people get the... What is it called? The accomplice or conspirator something conspirator you have to, you, if you only, all have a voting token you didn't mention that yeah everybody has a little magnifying glass voting token and you're going to vote put your magnifying glass in front of who you think is the spirit whatever you just conspirator. said conspirator and then if zero or one person or people get the conspirator guess correctly then the conspirator and the interrogator get money if more than two people are points if more than two people do it no one gets, or the interrogator and the conspirator do not get points, but everybody who guessed correctly gets three points. Regardless, so it's kind of the, everybody who guessed correctly gets points. So correct. that's, that's helpful. Yeah, so it's kind of the same kind of scoring as Dixit a little bit, but I liked this one a little bit better because it was more of a game to me. I liked the telling a story piece of it, and usually I hate that stuff. For but real. It made for it made for some laughing and good times, so... That was Detective Club. Yeah, I mean, I like this one because I like Dixit. And it was like almost like a combination between Dixit and Spyfall because you have the idea of one person doesn't know a piece of information that everybody else knows and they're trying to, you know, fumble their way through it. Um, but, I mean, I like that you're rewarded if you guess the right person. Like, I feel like that is good because I, I like that. However, I was never the conspirator in this. And so I felt like I didn't get the full, like gamut of the game like i couldn't right yeah but is i was the conspirator i was the conspirator twice not a very good one but i was successful once did someone still pick you though i think i was the only person that picked yeah you, but, but but i still got points that, that's though true. that's fine that's true i won this game so i feel pretty good about it anyway but it is interesting what it does different than dixit also is like dixit all i feel like a lot of the cards are widely desperate or disparate disparate not desperate disparate Vir- vira no weirdo that's gross <laughs> disparate because um like they don't maybe they have like fairy tale elements or something but in this they really i think worked hard to have repeated images 
happen in many of the cards. So it's a little bit easier for you to at least kind of find something that matches. Although sometimes the word that people pick is like way, way kind of off because they're trying, you you have to lay down two cards. So you kind of want to find a word that bridges both cards. And sometimes you don't have the same image or the joining thing. So um, yeah, it was pretty good. Not bad for a party type game. I like it. I like this one. It's it's up there as one of my favorite party games. Really? Yep. I mean, the bar is really low for that. So I think I would actually rather play Dix- Dixit than this. But Dixit's probably easier to explain. But if people have played Dixit before, I would bust this mm, one out. Okay, true. All right, so the last game we want to talk about is a game that we both played, and Jason has been wanting this forever, and we actually used a gift card to buy this one. And that is a game, Deep Blue. And we went into it. All he knew was that um, it stays in one. Push your luck. Let's push your luck. It stays a wonder. So their um, production quality is usually really great. And, you know, it is, it is a pretty fun game. So in Deep Blue, you um, have a boat and you are like a team of divers trying to get treasure. So there's these little tiles on the board and you've got two boats that you're moving around the tiles. And then you are um, using cards. It's actually kind of almost like a deck builder in a way that you've got these cards that can dictate your actions, either movement or they have some money. So you can buy um, more crew members that will give you either more money or make certain treasures worth more um, or help you buy more things like they just have or help you ward against some kind of like disasters. So then you go around and just choose to dive. When you dive, you're drawing gems out of a bag um, also in that bag are like running out of air or fighting off like sea creatures, sea monsters. Yeah. Um, and so you're trying to like, how, how many points can I get? Then you're playing cards during the dive to try and make certain gems worth more for you and then come back to the surface before those hazards will take you out. So it was pretty fun. I mean, I did terribly, but it was all right. I think now that you've played it once, if we played it again, well, when we play it again, you'll do better. Yeah. I don't, I don't know if I really love it, but I'll play it again. I like it. I like push your luck in every form. So I'm down. Of course. So that's <laughs> Deep Blue, Days of Wonder. Who, I don't know who, who designed that. It's, uh, I don't know, somebody I've never heard okay. of. It might be their first design, maybe. Oh, maybe. I mean, the artwork's pretty, like, neat, and the components are cool. You get these, like, little treasure chests to keep um, the points that you get from drawing the gems. Um, so that's really fun. And the board looks nice. So, yeah, it's a pretty good game. It's Deep Blue. So we decided in the madness that is the world today, um, this kind of apocalyptic world, Jason went to the grocery store and, like, could not believe. He's like, no one's here. It's quiet. And all the shelves are empty. What's happening? (laughs) Yeah, it was Walmart, too, and it's never quiet in there. Like... It was crazy. So we thought, what happens if, you know, since the Ohio governor especially is pretty progressive, if he decides like, hey, two weeks, we're going to have a complete shutdown of Ohio, um, only essential businesses, the rest of you stay at home. What games would we take? Like if we had to maybe be quarantined away from our house or go somewhere, if they said, okay, get out of here, we're all going to, we're going to put you in quarantine. What games would we take that we could play for a 14 day quarantine? So the games that I picked were based on, okay, what kind of games will keep me interested for 14 days? Like, yes, Jason and I each have three. So, you know, there's some variety there. But um, what is either challenging enough or um, changes up enough that I would take it for two weeks, just three games? So, Jace, what's your first game that you would take with us to quarantine? Yeah, so before I get started, I want to say that these aren't even my favorite games. Oh, for sure. Mine either. Mine either. Yeah. These are just games that I think have a lot of replayability, that meaning they have a lot of cards, or I like the feeling that they give me a lot and I can play it over and over and over. So that's kind of the criteria that I went with. Yep. So the first one I want to talk about is a cooperative deck building game. And it is called Marvel Legendary. I'm so surprised at this choice for you, actually. Yeah, so... So the reason I picked this one is it has a ton of content and we don't even own this game. We're still borrowing it. <laughs> but if or they left it at our house. I think, I, I if think you we're had just the babysitters like permanently <laughs> of this game. You yeah, know who I you are. Be. If you listen, you know. <laughs> but I think if you had all the content of this game, 
you could play this this game and only this game and never play the same combination of cards twice in like probably that 14 day period. So that's part of the reason why I picked this is just the replayability. It's always going to be different. It's always going to be something new. The other reason that I played it is as far as deck builders go and co-op games, this is probably one of my favorites because it's easy to play. It's easy to teach. And I, I enjoy it. The Marvel theme is cool. So that's kind of why I picked this one. So Marvel Legendary is my first one. Yeah. Um, the only reason I wouldn't pick this is because I only like to play with the X-Men. <laughs> um, I guess I haven't. there haven't been some of the expansions of other... We don't have expansions of other things that I really super love. But I really that's love true. X-Men. So I would only want to play with those. So it might get old for me after a while. Plus, I don't know. I mean, I'm surprised you picked it as cooperatively because I think there are deck builders, and I will mention one later, spoiler alert, that I'd say is better than this. Right, and I, I agree, but I think maybe if you're in a quarantine situation, you might want to work, maybe have one game <laughs> that you're playing together so you don't kind of, you know, get worn down, I guess. Okay, look at you being peacemaker. Yep, that's Chasing what I do. Chasing the ultimate care bear, even in quarantine. <laughs> <laughs> All right, my first choice is a game that I picked because the outcomes are always different, and maybe we, Jason and I both, have a gambling addiction or something, except Jason won't play real money. But this kind of satisfies that itch, and that is Homestretch. Now, Homestretch is not one of my favorite games. I do really like it. Um, (laughs) Obviously, we've talked about it many times on this podcast. Um, Not just us, but much more Joel before now. But the fact that, you know, it's a racing game and you're rolling dice. So you, yes, there are certain numbers for horses that should logically come out more often than others. But sometimes it doesn't happen. And you're also able to, you know, mitigate that. You've got these little bonuses that certain horses get. So you can try the idea. Then the strategy is how am I going to bet what's going to pay out? And so every time you're like, ooh, next time I'm going to do this or next time I'm going to try that. And just all those possibilities and all the different outcomes and just kind of the lighthearted, good natured part of this. Like, yes, it's a competitive game, but, you know, sometimes you own the same share of horses, somebody else, or you both bet the same. So you're kind of like, yeah, cheer on the same horse. Go number five, go five. Um, They have names, too, which we also use sometimes. But I think that kind of camaraderie is what's so great about this game. So that's why I picked Homestretch. Yeah, uh, I love betting on two and twelve. Just because they get like the long shot tokens where like the first movement they're gonna get like eighty percent around the board, so then they only have to roll the number one time. But that sometimes yeah, doesn't I, ever happen yeah, either. That's after the true. first one. But it's so fun. It's so fun to bet on those like that. Yeah, I think we could start a real good time in quarantine over this horse betting game. Yeah, I agree. That's a good pick. Um so my next pick is also a game that is push your luck ish. I mean, home stretch not really push your luck. It's just kind of betting, but this kind of gives you the same feel, and that is Quacks of Quedlinburg. So I really like push your luck, as we've discussed previously and on other podcasts and in videos. Um, so this game is all push your luck. You're pulling these little chits out of a, a bag. You're trying to fill your cauldron to make this potion. Maybe it, this potion can cure COVID nineteen. Mm-hmm. Who knows? But you're trying to pull these chits out, and you're trying not to get a certain amount of white ones to bust. That's the pandemic edition. And you want to get as far... Yeah. The... <laughs> you're trying to get as far around your cauldron as you can to get as many points and money to buy new chips to go into your bag before you bust. You're going to do it over nine rounds. It's really easy. Um, it's easy to teach. It just gives you that good, what's going to come out of the bag, I don't know. It kind of stretches you out a little bit, and I like that. So my number two game, in no particular order, Quacks of Quedlinburg. I also really like this game, and I like to play it a lot. And I would like to play it even more than we do. We just have so many games. Um, and another thing about this is that you've got those tiles, and we also have the expansion, so that gives you more variety. And the tiles have multiple sides or um, for the different colors that you can add in. There's multiple sides to them to use different powers, and so you can fluctuate between those. So um, for a while there, you won't even use the same power. So each game is really different. So that's also a bonus to it, too. Yeah, yeah I forgot about that because there are sides that I really like, and I usually just keep playing with those. So. Of course you do. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah, that is true. There's a lot of replayability. Um, the next game that I picked is because it's so difficult, and I'm itching to play this game again because it made me feel like a moron, and that is Alchemist. So we play this with our new hotness buddy, and I'm, I just really would love it if he'd let me borrow it for a while. And I would just make my own solo variant and play it over and over again to try and figure out 
the deduction portion of it because for some reason I was like way off, totally screwed it up. I don't know what the deal is. It was awful. Um, but the basic idea of the game, I think, is really interesting to find out what what combinations of um, colors make up each ingredient that you're trying to figure out. And I think I would happily play this by myself um, to try and figure that out and use the app like for all 14 days. I just think it would keep me inter- busy, entertained. And then also I know there's like a kind of advanced variant for it. So if I ever finally got good enough with the regular version, then I could try like that next version, which most people don't even play because the regular version is so complex. Well, and there's the expansion too. Well, that right. would add a whole bunch more craziness to it. That's true, but we don't own the game and I don't know the people that we're going to borrow it from own it either. So No, I'm just saying like if we had if we had these for quarantine in a perfect world, I would have all the stuff. Oh, okay. <laughs> Which is silly because you would never buy all the stuff. That's that's true, but we're talking about hypothet- hypothetical things. Well, it used to be hypothetical. This could become a reality. Right, right. We're, not, we're, try- we're trying to help people prepare. <laughs> These are things you need to consider. The variety of gameplay, yeah. the way it makes you feel, you know, the social dynamics, all these things are important to, for games during quarantine. Right, yeah, that's true. Yeah, Alchemist is good. I definitely want to play this again, too. I was figuring out the deduction okay. I just didn't win. I didn't do either. <laughs> it was bad. <laughs> Real bad. No, actually, I think I did win. Maybe you did. I don't yeah. know. Yeah. I think I did win. And boom, I'm good at this game. Great. All right. Now I'm taking off my list. <laughs> All right. So the last game I want to talk about is probably the, well, one of the lighter ones on this list. And it's called Wingspan. It's not lighter than home stretch by any means. Babe. Well, that, that's true. That's true. I, so I one of so maybe the second lightest. I don't know, Quacks is pretty late too. <laughs> yeah, but the reason I put this game on here, everybody knows what Wingspan is. Everybody knows how to play it, so I'm not going to go into that. But the reason that I put it into the quarantine piece is because it has a whole bunch of cards, right. and we have the expansion now as well, which adds even more cards and more goal cards and more goal like end of round scoring condition like little tiles. So the possibilities of playing the same cards over multiple games, yeah, some of them are going to come up, but there's also a pile that you're never going to see. So it's just going to always give you new birds, always give you new stuff to look at. So every game is going to be different, even though you're playing kind of the same thing, which is kind of why I picked this game. So that is Wingspan, and it's gorgeous, so it'll give you something nice to look at as well. That's true, and even though I hate birds, like... I do really like this game. I love building my engine and the different cards that come out each time. So your engine can be different each time. And for me, like, I want to play it more. Like, I've won this a fair number of times. Um, So I'm good at figuring it out. But I like that part of it. Like, okay, do I need to get, am I, are the birds I'm getting out getting me more gold cards? And I can work with that. Or am I getting cards that are helping me get, um, you know, food so I can put out more birds in general or like, what's my money maker? What's, what's coming out. And I, I love that about a game and yeah, there are birds I've still never seen in there. And now we've got the European expansion, which I've only played with once. So I can't even imagine all the birds that are in there. I kind of want to play this like right now. <laughs> That's how I felt about deep blue and you're talking about it. <laughs> oh, I definitely don't want to play that right now. I want to play wingspan right now. Wingspan is good. I agree. That's actually a good choice, babe. Proud of you. All mine are good choices. What are you talking about? Uh, I disagree because my last game, I think, will bump off one of your games. Um, Yeah, you're probably right. And I also, um, so I love engine builders. Another type of game I really love is the deck builder. I, I love taking like a really crappy deck. You don't have to bleep me. I was going to say something else, but you don't have to. Trying to keep... (laughs) Keep, Thank keep you. this family rated it. because of all of the quarantine families <laughs> that are together listening to this right now. Um, I like taking a crappy deck and like making it to something awesome where different cards jive with each other and you get those awesome combos. I love that. And so despite it's maybe not being so family friendly, uh, my last pick is Tonto Kore. Um, I have mentioned this a lot as one of my favorite games. It always comes up because people think I'm crazy. I tend towards being quite a feminist. And um, Tanto Kori definitely has some scantily clad women drawn on it. But, oh my gosh, the gameplay is so good. Like, it's so good. Um, there's all there, You get a ton of different cards in each set. I would probably take all the sets because it, they can all work together and play off each other. Each one of them has, like, a different... Um, 
What's the word I'm looking for? Special me- yes, mechanic. Yes, it has a different, like a new mechanic that you can use. So it gives you different goals for your games, um, different maids that do different things, different maids that chain off of other maids. Um, the idea of that balance between keeping maids active, putting maids in pri- private quarters, chambering them to get points. And then the new ways to score points with like the new mechanics. I, it's such a good game. And like there are a lot of times with deck builders, especially ones that have a lot of content where you get randomizers or, you know, you just decide to pull out, oh, I'm going to use these maids or whatever. Um, I've played some games where like when you do that randomly, there are lots of times where the games just don't jive. Like those maids just don't gel together. Not maids, but the different whatever factions or whatever you pull out don't really work together. And so your gameplay is kind of flat. I've never had that happen with Tonto. No matter what kind of weird made combos, Butler combos come out, they always seem to find a way to work and the game is so compelling and fun. So um, that would be my choice for a deck builder over Marvel legendary. So Tonto Quarry is my choice. Yeah. I mean, deck builders as a general rule would be great for this. Just because of the sheer fact there's so many cards. Like, I don't really like Dominion, because Tonto Quarry is a thousand times better. Word. But if you have Dominion and you have all the expansions, this would kind of do the same thing as you'd never play the same game twice. Except Dominion sucks, so don't do that. <laughs> right. But actually, what I was thinking of, the perfect game to play during a 14-day quarantine would be a legacy game. Because if you have your family in there, you can just bang out a bunch of games in a row to knock out the campaign well that's by the end of the two week period and that's true and we talked about that like i mentioned i considered like consulting detective because i just said i got that the new version which you my wonderful husband got me for our anniversary and i'm so excited about but i would probably finish it like i wouldn't sleep i'd finish it in three days and i'd be like well, what do i do now <laughs> and right, the same with yeah. the legacy like we started clank legacy and that game is so fun it's really so good, good. Yeah. um and then we'd be done in a couple of days. And then what are you going to do for the next 12 days you got or whatever? Yeah, that's so true. So that's kind of why but I I'm left just this off. But yeah, I see what you mean. Yeah. Yeah, and I didn't put... I had Lisboa on my list just as like a heavy game deal. But then I got to thinking, you know, is a, do I really want to be playing heavy games for 14 days and only heavy games? I mean, yes, I do. But not not everybody else feels that way. So I kind of took that off and put quacks on there instead. Well, and if we only had three, like, I don't think I'd want to keep coming back. Like, I, I like a lot of heavy yeah, games, right. but do I want to be playing our only three games we have are, you know, Gallerist, Marco Polo. Um, yes, that is the only three games that we need to play. And Lisboa, like, or Newton, yes. or Truth and Justice. Like, I, I really love those games. Yes, they're, like, in my top ten games. Absolutely. They're great games. Um, but if I'm under quarantine... You know, I don't I don't know that I could handle just those three on rotation for 14 days. Right. Yeah, I agree. I agree. You got to have like you got to give your brain a break occasionally. Yeah. As much as it pains you to say that, babe, I know. (laughs) It does. And I didn't put my favorite game on here. Like I was going to put Coimbra on the list, but I know that, you know, do I want to play that more than two or three times in a 14 day period? Probably not, just because it doesn't have a ton of variety like some of these other games. Right. So that's why I left that I one I know, off. my number one's Green Austria, and I love that game, and I would play that game a lot. But a lot for me is like once, twice a week. I, you know, I don't know if I'm filling up all my time with that in a 14-day quarantine. So, right, yeah. yeah. What are your guys' thoughts? What three games would you take with you if you got carted off to a 14-day quarantine? Not that the government's carting us off. I don't want to cause a panic. I don't want to be crazy. <laughs> okay, I'm just... <laughs> I'm just supposing that we don't have access to our 500 game collection and we limited it to three. What three games would you want and why? Now, maybe our criteria is not the same for you. Like we tend, we, we like the um, pressure luck. We like that kind. Maybe you want to take all party games because you want everybody to be happy and have a good time. Maybe you want to take like one game that takes hours and hours to play because you finally have the time to do it. So tell us on Facebook Join the riveted group if you haven't. Post it there. Send us a message on there. Um, send us a tweet. Send us an Instagram. Slip into our DMs. We're here for you. Don't get weird. I'm just saying. Virile. Stop. Will you quit? I want you to bleep out every <laughs> mention of that word because it's disturbing. <laughs> you know I'm not going to. I know you're not. Uh- <laughs> All right. You have anything else to say? No, I don't. I was just looking around trying to think of other games. 
But outside of being ridiculous choices, I think I'm just going to not say anything else. That sounds great. All right, everybody. (laughs) Stay healthy. Wash your hands. Remember, social distancing is not about you. It's about those people who have compromised immune systems. And, um, yeah, just keep it positive. We'll get through this. We really will. All right. I've been Katie. And I'm Jason. Keep gaming, everybody. Keep gaming.